Okay. Uh, let's get started. Uh, yes. So I know these are like a bunch of different convex sets. Uh -huh. What should we do with them? Part A. Oh, I see. The different sets. Yeah. You have to project. Did I not write? Oh, I see. I forgot to write. You have to project. You have to project uh, this x onto these sets. So I will write okay. it down. So that is three one c right? Mm -hmm. One c. 1c project x onto x. Okay. So roll up your sleeves because today we are going to talk about Lagrange multiplier theory and that's going to blow your mind away. Okay. So what is Lagrange multiplier theory? By the way, we are in chapter 3 now. Okay, so we completed chapter 1 and 2. Uh, well, most of chapter 1 and most of chapter 2. Now we are on to chapter 3. So, Lagrange multiplier theory is used for solving a general optimization problem with equality and inequality constraint. And Lagrange multiplier theorem, which I'm going to introduce in some time, is essentially a necessary condition for optimality for a point to be optimal uh, for a class of functions, for a class of optimization problems that can be written in this form. I want to minimize f of x such that hi of x is equal to 0, i equals 1, m, x is in Rn, and potentially m is well, I don't want to write that m is less than n or not, but for a function, for a problem to make sense, the number of equality constraints should be less than the number of uh, the dimension of this uh, this vector x. Okay, so this is our this is our goal for today. So let me. Uh, So let me see why, so let us see f with an example why such kind of problems would be, would be important. Well, not important, but I just want to give you a very fun example. So suppose there is, so x is in R2, okay, and there is the surface h of x equal to 0. It's a curved surface, okay, it's not a convex set anymore. And let's say this is the problem, okay? There is, the, let's say this is the shoreline of a lake, okay? This is the lake, and there is a person here who is drowning, okay? And you are standing here, so this is drowning person, and this is you, person A. And what you want to do is you want to save this person from drowning. What does that mean? How would you save that person? You have, to, you have to run as fast as you can and swim as fast as you can so as to reach this person, okay? What is it that you want to minimize in this problem? Time. Time, right? So you know that you have this velocity v1 here and you have this velocity v2 here, okay? You have some velocity to run and you have some other velocity to swim. Uh, so how would you solve, how would you, formulate this as an optimization problem. So let me consider this point as my x. Okay, so this is the point x which will be at the boundary of the lake and the land. So you want to minimize time from point A to point D, okay, subject to h of x is equal to 0, minimize with respect to x in R2. And what is time as a function of x? Uh, let's say this is my y1, ya, and this is my yd. So you want to minimize 
no, uh, T of x is given by x minus y a norm over v1 plus x minus y d over v2, right? v1 and v2 are constant, that is given to you. Okay, so whatever we have studied in chapter 1 and 2 cannot solve this problem. Why? Because you have a non, this is a convex function by the way, this is convex. Okay, but uh, the objective function here is convex, but the constraint set need not be convex. Okay, it is a curved surface, so it is not a convex surface. In fact, if I pick two points here, and I draw a line between them, it doesn't fall on the line at all, uh, on this curve at all, right? So it's not a convex set. So these are the class of problems that we want to solve in this class. Anyone knows what the answer to this question is? No? Okay, let me, let me simplify it. Let's assume that this hx is actually a straight line. Let's assume that it's like this. Anyone knows what the answer to this question is? No? Snell's law, right? This is Snell's law. Have, have you heard of Snell's law? Right? No? Okay. So this is the normal to the surface, this is your phi 1 and this is your phi 2 and Snell's law is a sine of phi 1 over v1 equals to sine of phi 2 over v2. Okay, so these angles have to be such that the the ratio of the sine of the angles has to be equal to the ratio of the velocities in this two medium. And in fact, light travels in this way, okay? So light takes minimum time from reaching from point A to point B, okay? That's the objective function of light or photons, okay? That's what the objective function of photons is. So it always tries to find, no matter what the surface is, it always tries to find the path that, get, that, get, that has minimum time from going from point A to point D, okay? And this is known as, a, this has a application in diffraction and so on, okay? So you look at a light from the prism and you see that, you see multiple colors. So lots of other things happen because of Snell's law. Okay, so let's see how we can go ahead and solve this problem. Uh, let us let us try and solve the problem because this is a convex problem. So we can solve it. Okay, hopefully, it, you will save somebody's life in the future using these ideas. So you want to minimize uh, norm of x minus y a x minus y d. X, this is X1 or X2 equal to 0. Uh, so what do I have? This is square root of X1. So actually this becomes a one dimensional problem, right? This is just X1 minus YA1 square plus YA2 square plus square root x2 minus, no, x1 minus y d1 square plus y d2 square. Okay, and all you have to do is minimize with respect to x1. Actually, that this problem seems very simple now with this simplifying assumption. Okay, now you can just take the first derivative, set it equal to zero and you will get the answer. 
Okay, any question? All right. Uh, so how should we go about thinking? How should we go about thinking about this problem? So I have a function. I have certain constraints, and I want to find a necessary condition for optimality. I want to find that if I have a point x star that is locally optimal, what sort of conditions should it satisfy? So let's uh, look at some picture. So this is my h1 of x. This is my h2 of x. Right? So this is my h1 of x equal to 0. This is my h2 of x equal to 0. So we essentially want to minimize this function over this line right so the this this line or this curve is the line where both h1 of x is equal to 0 and h2 of x is equal to 0 okay and i'm what i'm claiming is let's say this is my x star this is my x star so what what so if this is a local minimum what should this x star satisfy? What condition should this x star satisfy? Let's uh, pause for a moment and think about it. Any thoughts? Any thoughts on how we can so if x star is optimal, what conditions should, it, should this, this point satisfy? Sorry? Gradient, well, do you need the gradient to be equal to 0? Probably not. And gradient may not be 0 because you are on a constraint surface. Okay, let's say this is my gradient. Okay, this is my gradient at x star, and what I want, what I want is if I move in this direction along the curve, or if I move in this direction along the curve, the cost should increase, right? Okay, now what are these directions? These are the directions on the surface of h1 and h2. Okay. So what should these directions satisfy? So in particular, if I pick a direction D, which is moving in that direction, what should that D satisfy in terms of the known things, which is h1 of x is equal to 0 and h2 of x is equal to 0? Let's, let's look at it this way. Here is my surface. Here is a point and I'm moving in this direction. Let's say this is my direction D and this is my x. What is the gradient of h? What is gradient of h for a curved surface? Anyone knows what gradient of h looks like? Sorry? Tangent? Normal? Okay, so it is normal actually. The so gradient of h of x is a normal and the d is tangent okay so what do you see here that this d which is the first order variation over the surface has to make exactly 90 degree with respect to the surface okay so gradient of h of x transpose d will be equal to 0 Okay, where D is the first order variation. So now I have two surfaces, right? So I can only slide on the surface of these two surfaces. Okay, which means I can only move along this line where these two surfaces intersect, which means that 
that d will be in v of x star which I am going to define as d such that gradient hi of x star transpose d is equal to 0 for all i in 1 to m. Okay. This is my uh, first order first order feasible variation. Okay, so now I have characterized the set of first order feasible directions along which I can move in this set which satisfies the constraints. What do you think would be gradient of f at x star transpose d? What should this be equal to? zero right it should be equal to zero so does that ring so by the way this d is is equal to zero for all d in v x star okay what would that imply what would this imply well, let's see, for all d that is normal to the gradient of the surface at x star, so those d's is also normal to the gradient of f at x star. What does that mean? Sorry? That's right. So there exist lambda 1, lambda 1 star, lambda m star such that gradient of fx star plus summation lambda i star gradient of hi x star is equal to 0. Okay. What does that mean? The gradient of the function is in the same plane as the gradient of h i's okay so if i'm going back to this well i'll let you guys write and i want to go back to this figure and show you what exactly is happening okay so here is my gradient of fx star here would be my gradient of h 1 of x and this would be my gradient of h2 of x okay and what I am saying is that if you look at the plane that passes through x star and that, sp that is spanned by these two vectors gradient of f lies within that plane okay that is what this means that is all I am saying that the gradient of f lies in the same plane that is spanned by gradient of h1 and gradient of h2 at this point x star. By the way, this should be x star. Okay. So now we, do, we need to make this. So this is our intuition. This is what we want to prove. Okay. Uh, so let's see how do we go about proving it. Any questions so far on whatever we have covered? Okay, everything is clear. You have a question? Oh, how do I get this? Well, yes, so if you remember, uh, at this point x star, 
I can move in that direction or I can move in this direction, right? And in whichever direction I move, my function is going to increase, right? Because it's a local minimum. So if you look at the first derivative of the function, in, those, in that direction itself, it has to be equal to zero, right? In other directions, I don't care, right? But in the direction in which I can move, it has to be equal to zero. Then only it would be a local minimum. Any other question? Yes. So if we want to satisfy this condition, uh, the length of that line should be infinity, right? Which line? This line should be infinity. This line? Yeah. If S star is the to the the line, then Okay, so I have a curve may not be a line, okay, it can be a curve. So I have a curve, I have a point x star. What is your point? If the point is the, uh, the, how to say that, like, the, uh, I don't know how to say that, like, the, Two endpoints? Yeah, two endpoints, yeah. Okay, so there is no inequality constraint here, so there are no endpoints. This is going all the way to infinity. But I can't show it on the board that it's going to infinity. Okay? But this, this line essentially goes all the way to infinity, and this line goes here all the way to infinity. Okay? Wherever the surfaces are intersecting. But we will get to that point, may not be in this class, but end of next week we'll get to inequality constraint problems as well. So the Lagrange multiplier theorem says, if x star is a local minimum and gradient h1 x star gradient hm x star are linearly independent then there exist lambda 1 star, lambda m star in R such that gradient of f at x star plus summation lambda i gradient h i x star is equal to 0. Okay, so something else appeared here out of nowhere, which is that the gradients have to be linearly independent. Okay, so proof by picture is not very strong. Okay, we have to come up with a mathematical proof, and when you do that, you do need this condition. So this is my first order necessary condition. The second order necessary condition is that D transpose lambda i star.
Okay, so we have first order necessary condition and second order necessary condition here. Let us look at an example where this linearly independence of the gradients fail. So the example is as follows. I want to minimize x1 plus x2. So x is in R2 such that uh, x1 minus 1 square plus x2 square is equal to 1, x1 minus 2 square plus 2x2 plus x2 square is equal to 4. So the picture that I want you to have in mind are two, con two circles that look like this. There is only one point that is in the feasible set, okay, this point. And what is the normal at this point? So this is my h1 of x is equal to 0. This is my h2 of x is equal to 0. This is my x1 x2. What is the outward normal? It is this, okay, for both the circles, or for both the surfaces. At this point, this is the only point where these two circles meet. This is the origin. And at the origin, the outward normal to these two surfaces is in the same direction, okay. So, they are not, they are not linearly independent. They are linearly dependent. What is the gradient of f? Gradient of f 1 1. Okay, so the gradient is always in this direction. Okay. So this theorem fails if your gradients are not linearly independent. Okay, so you really need them to be linearly independent for this theorem to work. Yes? Well, if you look at gradient of h1 and gradient of h2, what is the plane that is spanned by them? That is this line. Okay. I mean, it is not a plane anymore, it is just a line. See, if if gradient of h1 was this and this was gradient of h2, then they span the entire plane and then f gradient of f can lie anywhere in that plane. But because gradient of h2 is in the same direction as gradient of h1, all they span is a line. They don't span a plane anymore. Do you see that? So any linear combination of gradient of h1 and gradient of h2 is going to be in this li along this line. It's not going to be along that line. How about having just one edge, one edge? Oh, that's a good point. What happens if there is only one edge? Let me just remove one of these constraints. I'm going to remove the constraint. And let me pl let me plot the ISO cost curve. Okay, so this is x1 plus x2 equals to five. X1 plus x2 equals to four. Okay, so now my x star is here. Okay, this will be my x1 plus x2 equals to whatever the minimum value is. Okay, and so at this point, what's the gradient? 
it may be along this direction or maybe along the other direction depending upon how you write that constraint okay and what's the gradient of f it's along the other direction right make sense so by removing the constraint you have only one gradient so of course it's linearly independent as long as it is non zero right and and then you the lagrange multiplier theorem holds by the way if you look at it this is a non convex problem this is not a convex problem anymore okay any further question yes Right. And uh, suppose one of them, suppose H M is linearly dependent on H one and H two. Right. Then H M can be written as the sum of H one and H two. Right. right. So there will be M minus one gradients. Right. Right. And hence we can find, still find lambda one to lambda M minus because that condition still needs to hold that uh, delta M delta I X X X star is equal to zero as well as delta F X star is equal to zero. No, no, it won't. It won't work out because you see the number of feasible directions you have has reduced because. Uh, so when you had the single point here, there was no feasible direction to move, right? So. So in fact, in fact, your v of x star was just a zero set. So gradient of. f x star transpose d is equal to 0 because d equal to 0 is the only zero in is the only element in that set so when you have linearly dependent vectors in general you cannot have a a well defined set of feasible directions in which you can move maybe sometimes you can maybe sometimes you can't sometimes gradient of gradient of f can be in the plane spanned by gradient of h1 to hm minus 1 right but but then you will have to go ahead and prove it you can't use lmt or lagrange multiplier theorem to prove it okay and in general that wouldn't happen this is the most general result you can ever come across okay all it requires is linear independence of these gradients and if that fails then you have to come up with another set of conditions that's not part of lagrange multiplier theory Okay. Yes. So you mean if there's only one constraint, then the gradient of h x is always at the same line with the gradient of f x. Yes, it has to, as long as the gradient of h is not zero. Okay, at x star. Okay, so we'll now go ahead and prove this result and see why the linear independence. was required so i am going to use the approach which is known as penalty approach and there are other approaches that uses implicit function theorem also to prove this result but we are not going to use that approach we will use penalty approach and the idea is as follows you define a function fk of x which is fx plus k over 2 norm of hx square plus alpha over 2 x minus x star square and i'm going to define a set s as the set of x such that norm of x minus x star is less than equal to epsilon okay and i'm going to define xk as my argument of fk of x over s x is an s and my k is a natural number alpha is a k 
strictly positive constant. Okay, so what's the situation? This is my x star and I look at a ball around this x star, okay, a ball of radius epsilon around this x star and I define this function which is unconstrained, which is defined over this entire ball around x star and it's unconstrained and I look at the minimum of that function over this set S. So this is an unconstrained, this is an unconstrained, well, it's a constrained minimum because you are looking at the minimum in a small neighborhood of x star, okay? But otherwise it can go in any direction. In particular, you are allowed to, uh, you are allowed to uh, violate the constraint, right? But you see, you are going to pay a penalty for it, for violating the constraint. So hx equal to zero is the constraint. Well, let's say you don't want to be at that surface, so you have to going to you are going to pay some penalty which is indexed by k, okay? And I'm going to take k going to infinity, okay? So the penalty for violating the constraint is going to become higher and higher as I increase the value of k. So the claim is x k converges to x star. Okay, so we need some facts for that. So the first is f k x k is less than equal to f k x star, which is equal to f of x star. That's number one. Number two is limit k going to infinity of norm of hxk is going to go to zero. So is this point fact number one clear to everyone? Why should that hold? Okay, so f k x k has to be less than equal to f k x star because x k is the argument in the set S and x star lies in the center of the set S. So that should be true. But we know that this term will vanish at x star and this term will vanish at x star. So all we are left with is f of x star. So my f k of x k is less than equal to f of x star now, as I take k going to infinity, as I take k going to infinity, what I see is that this entire function, okay, let me, let me try to prove this. So, I have limit of x k x k, k going to infinity is less than f of x star, right, because it holds for every point, so the limit will also satisfy this constraint. So what happens in the limit? I have f of x k, which is a bounded sequence. I have k over 2 h x square, which is growing, right, because k is growing as k is going to infinity, and x k minus x star, which is bounded by epsilon. So this is a small number. This is a small number or, or a bounded number, and this term is growing. This term is growing as k goes to infinity. So it, and this entire term is bounded by a constant f of x star. So therefore, this thing necessarily has to go to zero as k goes to infinity. Because if it is not going to zero as k goes to infinity, this term is going to blow up because it's getting multiplied by k, which is going to infinity, right?
is that clear okay third thing is if xk converges to x bar okay so let's consider a hypothetical situation where xk is converging to x bar then we know that h of x bar will be equal to 0 right from here okay then this holds true and we also know that f of x bar plus alpha over 2 x bar minus x star square is going to be less than equal to f at x star okay so if xk was converging to a point then i know that h of x bar has to be equal to 0 because it satisfies this condition and then f of x bar plus alpha over 2 x bar minus x star will be less than equal to f of x star that comes from here okay what else do i know i know that this is a compact set okay so if it is a compact set the sequence of xk will have a limit okay we'll have a limit point within this set so for those of you who don't who haven't heard of this uh, result before don't worry uh, it's a very well known result and you might encounter it in some other math course that you might take so just take it for granted at this moment that because this set is closed and bounded if you pick a sequence there has to be a limit point of that sequence so there has to be a subsequence which will converge to a point within the set so that comes from the fact that the set is closed and bounded okay so that we know so fact 4 is that h of x bar is equal to 0 therefore x bar is in the feasible set which implies f of x star has to be less than if equal to f of x bar right so x bar satisfies this constraint h of x bar equal to 0 so x bar is in the feasible set so f of x star is the, so x star is the minimum point right uh, of this function over this constraint set so it certainly should satisfy this expression this expression and this expression tells us what 5 is 3 plus 4 implies x star equals to x bar okay why is that because this term necessarily has to be equal to 0 okay so x bar must be equal to x star because if this term was non zero alpha is a positive number so this becomes non zero and then f of x bar is strictly less than f of x star and f of x star is less than equal to f of x bar so there is a contradiction so this term must be equal to 0 so that tells me that x star is equal to x bar any question yeah Uh, that's what we proved that it turns out that it has to go to xk will eventually become in the get in the closer neighborhood of x star right well it may not be very close to x star you can have xk that is going around the surface right maximum distance is epsilon yes maximum distance is epsilon but you can still have a sequence that is just going around in circle okay what we have proved that that's not the case here in this problem okay, but epsilon is very small. 
I mean, you can take it as large as you want. Yeah. Uh, well, in this is this is the case in electrical engineering where epsilon can take any value. <laughs> okay, but uh, still, you would want to remain in the small neighborhood of x star because if you go out of it, it may not be a local minimum anymore. Well. It might still be a local minimum, but you are looking at the local condition, not at the global condition. All the facts? Only one. Only one. Okay. Uh, so xk is the argument of fk when it is in the set uh, S, and x star is in the set S. Right. So that means fk xk is less than or equal to fk of S fk of x for all x in for all x in s right it's an unconstrained minimum okay so that's what happens oh why is this equal so h of x star is equal to 0 and x minus x star is equal to 0 What do you mean k? So this fk of x star doesn't change with k because this term is 0. Right? So f of, x k, f of x star plus k over 2 multiplied by 0 plus alpha over 2 multiplied by 0. OK. So what we have proved is xk converges to x star, which means xk is not at the boundary all the time. OK? Eventually, it breaks the boundary and gets arbitrarily closer to x star and eventually converges to x star as k goes to infinity. OK. So for k large enough, xk is close to x star and xk is unconstrained local minimum of fk of x. Okay. So what does that imply? Gradient of fk xk is equal to 0. What am I doing? So once this point moves inside, okay, so this is my let's say x 10 raised to 6. So once it moves inside, I know that this x 10 raised to 6 is an unconstrained minimum of this f 10 raised to 6. Okay? And then I'm saying that, well, the gradient has to vanish because it's an unconstrained minimum. Is that clear? So let me uh, do the, the gradient calculation. So that's k multiplied by gradient h of xk multiplied by h of xk plus alpha xk minus x star. Let me multiply it by gradient h of xk, so multiply transpose to both sides. And I want to note here that, let me note it here.
okay so gradient of h of x is a vector in n cross m okay and one thing that you might recall for, from linear algebra is that if a vector is if a matrix is full rank if a is a matrix and a is full rank then a transpose a would be invertible okay as long as the number of rows is less than the number of columns or rather number of rows will be greater than the number of columns so well linear algebra says that a in r n cross m full rank implies that a transpose a is invertible okay so i'm using that idea here that it's full rank therefore i can take a transpose a and i can invert it without any problem so if i plug it in there what i get is uh let me define so i have i am going to define i am going to define the multiplication of k and hxk as k goes to infinity i am going to define it as lambda star that would be my lagrange multiplier so what i have is uh, minus gradient xk transpose gradient fxk plus alpha xk minus x star okay so if i re multiply this to both the sides and i rearrange terms i get k multiplied by hxk in this form everything is continuous so i can take k going to infinity and i am going to rename k of hxk equals to lambda star and i take k going to infinity in this expression so i get limit k going to infinity gradient of fk xk is equal to gradient of fx star plus gradient of hx star multiplied by limit k going to infinity k hx k and this is lambda star by definition by well i'm just defining lambda star in this fashion okay and i know that lambda star exists because every term in this function is continuous so as k goes to infinity it converges to some value okay so that's given by lambda star so this is basically lagrange multiplier theorem which says that this limit is equal to 0 right because it's zero for every point uh for k sufficiently large so what you have is the unconstrained limit of the gradient sorry the limit of the gradient is equal to 
and that's given by this expression, and that's Lagrange multiplier theorem. And where did we need the fact that it's linearly independent in order to show that this is invertible? Okay, and the second order conditions can also be proved in a similar manner. Okay, you have to take the limit and massage the equations and you will find the second order conditions. Okay, any, any question? That was a lot of linear algebra, okay. This is the worst class of this entire semester, I, <laughs> I admit, but we have to go through it. Any other question? Any question? Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. I'll see you on next week. <laughs>